antivenom for him. It wasn't specific for any, because they didn't hmm. have an ID on the snake. Oh, sure. Hmm. That's interesting. I've always wondered if a hospital would have Massasauga antivenom. Didn't have it on hand. We had. I would. I think they had. I would doubt it. I think they had to send to Cook County Hospital. Okay. Sarah, are you I'm on mute. Sarah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this actually worked out because a bunch of our people are coming into the that, that worked out. Um, okay. If you have just joined us and you have not introduced yourself to us yet, um, we'd love to hear in the chat where you're joining us from and um, whether or not you like snakes and feel free to share your favorite snake stories and we'll have time to uh, delve more into them perhaps later if we want to. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'll do quick introductions. Um, so today we have our guest speaker who will be discussing amphibians and reptiles and the habitats they're found in Northwest Indiana. Brock is an ecologist and herpetologist with Cardno, um, which is a local land management um, Firm. I'm not sure if that's the best way to describe you. Sorry, anyone with a uh, card note. <laughs> <your breath>. um, Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we work with Cardno on a number of things, and Brock has um, done some surveys on a couple of our nature preserves in North Indiana. Um, so we are happy to have him here to uh, present more about what he's learned about our herpetoform. What's the word for that? I was thinking about that today, Brock. Uh, there's a couple names, herpetofauna or herp tiles, some, some people use, I usually just say reptiles and amphibians, because if you say herpetofauna, people look at you like, huh? <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's a so, reason to overcomplicate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I am Sarah Barnes. I'm the programs manager at Shirley Hines Land Trust. Um, if you are having an issue for whatever reason, you can private message me in the chat, um, or if you got the reminder email from me, you also have my phone number, you can text or call if you have any issues during the meeting. And then we also have Eric here. Eric Bird is our stewardship manager, or stewardship time. director at Shirley Hines Land Trust. Um, and so you can reach out to him as well. Uh, but we'd love to have a lively chat here. So feel free to pitch in any questions. Um, we'd love to have an interactive conversation. So if anything, you know, comes to mind, you feel free to come off mute and um, ask your question or use the raise hand feature. Um, and uh, we'll kind of get to questions as they come along if you leave them in the chat. Uh, and yeah, you're welcome to kind of jump in when it feels right to you. And with that, I'll let Brock take it away. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and thank all of you for attending and uh, taking some time out of the middle of your week to listen to me ramble on about uh, amphibians and reptiles and uh, the habitats here in northwest Indiana that they call home. Uh, I was excited when Sarah came to me about the idea of doing a presentation on reptiles and amphibians. Uh, this is a, an idea for a presentation I've had for a while. Um, and the reason is, is that I think Northwest Indiana is, is a really unique place uh, for reptiles and amphibians. Uh, herps, I guess is, I guess I didn't think of that, Sarah. Herps is generally what I uh, call reptiles and amphibians. Uh, it's a really unique area for herps uh, because we have a really diverse set of habitats that these herps call home. Um, and I don't think a lot of people necessarily realize that. So I'm excited to share that with all of you today. 
Uh, and I will share my screen here. And let me know if you can see it. Yeah, we can yeah, see it. You can see it. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. So when we're talking about uh, the diversity of herps in our area. Uh, it's really related to the diversity of the natural areas that we have in Northwest Indiana. And that all starts uh, with the fact that we have this intersection of biomes in Northwest Indiana. And a biome is basically just a broad description of habitats over uh, a fairly large area. So if you can see this map of the United States, uh, this color here uh, indicates temperate, uh, broadly forests. And this color over here is the temperate grasslands area. Um, and if we zoom in to our region here in Northwest Indiana, you can see that we have both uh, this grassland biome and uh, the Eastern broadleaf forest biome, uh, both in our region here in Northwest Indiana. And with that, there are some herb species that are adapted to live in these grassland areas and some herb species that are adapted to live in these uh, forested areas. And you can find both of those groups uh, in our region. In addition to that, uh, the, the effect that Lake Michigan is also another component that makes our natural regions and our herb species uh, very diverse. So the fact that Lake Michigan has a effect on our weather where it makes our summers a little cooler and it makes our winters a little warmer, that um, allows for species that are uh, typically found further north to also be in our region, uh, but also species that are found further south uh, to be in our region as well. So we kind of have this convergence of species from all around us or groups of species from all around us that occur in this area. And a good example of that uh, is a comparison between the blue spotted salamander and the marbled salamander. So the blue spotted salamander, uh, this is a range map for uh, the blue spotted salamander up here. And if you can see the colored uh, areas of the country, you can see that this species is mostly found north of Indiana uh, with a small portion of its range uh, kind of dipping down into our region and just slightly south. And that's compared to the marbled salamander that's almost completely different or pretty much the opposite where it's found mostly in the south and then a small portion uh, of its range is located here in our region, uh, just by Lake Michigan. Now, I'll also mention that the marbled salamander has not been found in our region for a couple decades. Um, it did used to occur here as late as the 60s in pretty um, high numbers, but uh, unfortunately, their populations have declined to the point where nobody's really found them in a few decades. They might still be around, but, um, but still, uh, this is a trend that we see over a variety of species where uh, the range might be further south, but they're also found in this region. And so I, I like to joke that uh, the, the Indiana State slogan is referring to uh, herps more than anything, because it's the crossroads of all of our herp species uh, throughout uh, the eastern half of the United States. So I'm going to petition to have them put a little frog here in the corner, I think, just to make sure it's clear for everybody. Okay, so now that we know that there's 
all this diversity in habitats and the type of the number of species we have. We have, just to summarize, we have nine frog, two toad, and 10 salamander species of, of amphibians. And then we have, for reptiles, we have three lizard, 19 snake, and 10 turtle species. And the, the real influence on why these, these species have all these different ranges, why some live in grasslands and some live in forests, uh, all has to do with uh, their biology, especially for herps, uh, because reptiles and amphibians both are what we call ectothermic. Uh, and ectothermic means that they rely on their external environment to regulate their body temperature. Uh, and that's different from like mammals like us uh, who can regulate their body temperature on their own. We don't need to uh, be in a warm spot for us to have a proper body temperature. So that's for both reptiles and amphibians. They're both ectothermic. Uh, but what makes amphibians unique uh, is that almost all of them uh, breed in water, so they need some sort of aquatic habitat. Um, so that obviously affects uh, where they live and what type of habitats they live in. Uh, they have two life stages. For the most part, there are exceptions, but most of them have two life stages. And a good example of that is a tadpole and a frog. So that's, that's the two different life stages for uh, frogs and toads. And uh, they also, which is this next one is a really unique feature for amphibians. They require moisture on their skin to breathe. So all amphibians breathe through their skin, at least partially. A lot of most amphibian species also have lungs to breathe, uh, but all amphibians have moist skin. So if you ever picked up a frog, they feel kind of slimy. Uh, they have they retain that moisture on their skin with mucus and that that moisture on their skin helps oxygen pass through their skin and into their bloodstream. And that's also why amphibians are generally more affected by some sort of chemical pollutant because they allow compounds to enter their body into their bloodstream because they do this to breathe. And there's even a group of salamanders called the lungless salamanders. Uh, and they're called that, you guess it, because they don't have lungs. They've actually evolved to breathe entirely through their skin. And because of that, these salamanders definitely need moist environments to prevent them from drying out because that's the only way they're able to breathe. And we have uh, a couple of representatives in this group and the most common being our redback salamanders. Uh, these uh, salamanders live in woodlands predominantly, and they have no lungs. They need uh, nice, moist environments to live in. Reptiles are a little different because they don't breathe through their skin, and they don't have, they don't need to maintain moisture on their skin, and they've actually uh, developed scales uh, as a way to retain moisture in their body. So they are much better able to tolerate drier habitats. So as a general rule, and we'll touch on this theme uh, kind of throughout this presentation, as a general rule, reptiles are found mostly in drier habitats with less tree cover or canopy cover because those habitats tend to uh, have more evaporation and dry out quicker. Whereas uh, amphibians, you generally find more amphibians in uh, habitats that have more water available and more moisture. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions to that, but that is kind of the general theme uh, there for the reptiles and amphibians. Well, Brock, we had one question, which um, did get a little bit of an answer, but in case people missed it, uh, so next ask, do salamanders start as tadpoles? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, salamanders have 
uh, kind of a unique kind of. So it's, they don't look exactly like tadpoles. Uh, they're called, some people call them mud puppies. Uh, that's always what I heard them called when I was a kid, even though that's actually a separate species of, of salamander. Uh, but they look li really different. So tadpoles won't have any legs when they come out of the egg. Uh, larval salamanders for most species will have uh, fully developed limbs when they come out of the eggs. And they also have external gills. You'll see these big plumes of of external gills uh, just behind the head for larval salamanders. So they, they look different, but they are, they are also aquatic. And then they will metamorphose into an adult salamander, just like tadpoles will metamorphose into an adult frog um, out of the wetlands. Great question. There's one more. Um, OK. Better later. Durante asked, how many reptiles breed or birth in water? Oh, mm, that's a good question. Uh, we have several uh, water snake slash wetland snake species, and that includes our garter snake species. Uh, they are wetland snakes. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'd have to think about that for a while and count. But uh, maybe I'll come back to that and answer it after I have a time to think. <clears throat> All good questions. Okay, so um, if we talk about the, the different requirements for reptiles and amphibians in general, where reptiles like dry environments, uh, and amphibians like more moisture in their environment. Uh, that really goes back to having two different biomes in our region. So grasslands are generally drier because they have less trees and less canopy to hold in moisture. Whereas forested areas tend to have more moisture because the, the leaves of the trees prevent uh, the sun from causing evaporation uh, down on the ground. Um, and it's also the, the lake, as I mentioned as well, also has an influence on the, those different moisture level levels that we have throughout our region. So typically on the Eastern and Southeastern side of Lake Michigan is where we get uh, more precipitation from the lake, from lake effect uh, events or lake effect weather. And it's also uh, where we get um, some different, probably more frequent uh, temperature buffers because of the winds that come off Lake Michigan are more commonly from west to east or northwest to southeast. Um, but another, another factor that influences where we can find certain amphibian and reptile species is the ge geology of our area. And most of our geology was formed from glaciers. And so an example of like a geologic feature that we have in our region is uh, this depicted in this figure here that I took from the Florida Chicago region. Uh, and the brown color, and this is a moraine. Uh, this is called the Valparaiso moraine. And basically what a moraine is, it's a big, long linear ridge that was pushed up uh, from a glacier uh, several thousand years ago. And so, this area right here is representing this long linear ridge that runs through our region. And there's a certain uh, habitat that kind of uh, is on this general area here on the moraine. Another uh, geological feature or natural division, division as they're called that we have in our region is the glacial lakes natural division. Uh, and this is, fairly similar, similar to the, the moraineal natural division, 
uh, but it has a lot of lakes in this area, this blue region right here. They're big, deep lakes. They're often called kettle lakes. Uh, so that's indicative of that area. Uh, number three, the third natural division that we have is the Lake Plain Natural Division. And this is a, an area that uh, just a few thousand years ago used to be underwater uh, because Lake Michigan used to be much larger. Uh, so it's fairly flat until you get right next to the lake where sand dunes have been built up. And then our fourth natural division is the Grand Prairie Natural Division. And this is basically an extension from the grassland biome, uh, biomes that uh, the grassland biome further west that enters into our region. So we have these four distinct uh, natural divisions or geological areas, you could call them as well, that also affect where reptiles and amphibians are found in our region. But of course, not all of these areas are the same throughout. There is variation within. And this is where we get all these different factors mixing together. So the, the effect from the lake mixes with the geological features that we have and mixes with the biomes that we have to make uh, these little sections here which are distinct kind of habitat, larger habitat areas that we have. And I'll also say, um, so a lot of these natural geological areas are cut from east to west. As you can see here, there's an eastern and western part of this green area, an eastern and western part of this uh, brown moraine area. And a lot of that has to do with the effect of Lake Michigan. So the eastern side is typically has more forested area, has a denser forest uh, area to it, whereas the western side is usually more open and has less trees on it uh, as a general rule. So the western Valparaiso moraine uh, and eastern Valparaiso moraine are both generally forested, uh, but the western side of the moraine has less dense forest area, and the eastern side is more dense forested area, and has tends to have more moisture uh, in those habitats. Uh, the northern lakes region isn't divided because it's all on this eastern side, uh, so it's pretty much all densely forested area with uh, those deep kettle lakes, as I mentioned before. And then you get to the Lake Plain and it becomes uh, all chopped up into little pieces uh, because of how close it is to the lake. Uh, so the 3B is the Gary Lake Plain right here. This is a flat area that has a lot of prairies, a lot of open habitat, not a lot of trees. Uh, whereas 3C, Benton Harbor Lake Plain is still flat uh, because it used to be underwater, not. Uh, a few thousand years ago, but it has uh, more forested areas. Again, the same thing. The east side has more forest, the west side has less. Uh, and then when we get right next to the lake, we get to the Gary Dune Ridge area, which is in Northern Lake County and the High Dunes area over here. The High Dunes would be like our Indiana Dunes uh, National Park. Uh, and this is, there's not necessarily as much of a difference with forest area in these two, uh, but there is a big difference in the height of the dunes. So because the winds predominantly come out of the northwest off the lake here, this area built up higher sand dunes uh, compared to the Gary Dune Ridge where it's very shallow uh, dunes uh, in this region. And all of this, oh, and then we have one more, the Kankakee Sands section and the Kankakee Marsh. This area down here isn't as affected by uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, it's mostly divided because 4C used to be the extent of the Kankakee Marsh, was, which was this massive marsh uh, long ago. 
uh, it has since been ditched and drained, fortunately. And 4B is the uh, sandy outwash associated with that uh, marsh. That, so 4B would be like the sandy upland areas and 4C would be the, the old Kankakee Marsh. So that might be a lot to take in. I realize this, there's a lot going on here, but just realize each of these little sections has unique traits about it that affect what species of amphibians you can find in them and what species of reptiles you can find in them and also affect the number of reptile species you find versus the number of amphibian species that you find in them. And we'll go through uh, some of the habitats within these uh, little sections here in our region. And I'll highlight a few species that, uh, that live there. All right, let's go. Let's start with the Gary Dune Ridge section. So in the Gary Dune Ridge, really the most predominant habitat type is the dune and swale. And the dune and swale is this uh, series of uh, dune ridges and uh, wetlands that are trapped between the dune ridges. And the, the dune ridges are actually old shorelines of Lake Michigan. So Lake Michigan used to be all the way out here, and as it slowly receded, it left all these old shorelines here that you can see. If you can see all these lines that look like it's kind of like rings on, uh, on a planet, maybe you could say, or I don't know a good analogy for that. But you can see all these parallel lines that run over here and this, this dark spot being Lake Michigan. Uh, these are old shorelines of Lake Michigan. And between those shorelines, you get these wet areas or swales as they're called. So that's this really unique formation uh, that has dry upland dunes made of sand and shallow wetland areas in between. And there's a few intact portions left. A lot of it has actually been uh, destroyed, unfortunately. Uh, but Shirley Hines has a few uh, preserves that have this habitat. So Sidner Dune and Swale is one in Ivanhoe South. It's another good one. And some of the herbs that you can find in Dune and Swale, uh, and you typically, because it's open, you typically find uh, more reptiles versus amphibians in these habitats. And one species you can find in the upland areas are glass lizards. Uh, they look like snakes, but they're actually a lizard. So it's a lizard that doesn't have any limbs. Uh, and they're called glass lizards because when they feel threatened, they'll actually detach their tails as a distraction so they can get away from predators. And so they're said, their tails are said to break off like glass. Uh, so they, they move a lot like snakes, uh, but they're unique because they can detach their tail and they will grow it back uh, later. So neat uh, lizard species we have there. Uh, in the swales, you might be able to find a spotted turtle, although they are endangered in the state of Indiana and pretty much any other state you can find them in. Uh, they like the shallow wetland habitats in between uh, the dunes. Uh, in the middle of the swales, uh, they're a smaller species. They get to about the size of your hand. Uh, and a lot of the reason why they're endangered is because people think they look cool. And so they wanna take them home as a pet. And enough people have done that uh, as a personal pet or have sold them uh, on the black market pet trade uh, to where their numbers have really declined. And then the fact that a lot of their habitat has been destroyed as well certainly doesn't help. So uh, that's a species that's kind of in trouble. And then tiger salamanders is one of the few amphibians you can find in deer and swale. Uh, tiger salamanders are actually a prairie species, so they're pretty well adapted to the dry environments, the dry upland sand ridges. 
uh, endurance whale, but they obviously use the swales for breeding habitat. All right, next one. Uh, let's go down to the Gary Lake Plain uh, over here. Uh, which is just south of the Gary Dune Ridge. So in the Gary Lake Plain, it's really flat. Uh, the water table is really high and there's not a lot of trees. So it's a perfect uh, area for wet prairies. And so these wet prairies don't have hardly any trees in them, maybe a few shrubs. Uh, and this, these prairies are an extension of that grassland biome that comes from the western portion of the United States. Uh, and some Shirley Hines properties that have some good wet prairies are like Crestmore has portions that are wet prairie, Gordon and Faith Griner Nature Preserve and Hidden Prairie as well. They're really beautiful uh, habitats to be in. I love uh, wet prairies, one of my favorites. Uh, and that's also because you'll find some unique uh, herb species there. And again, because it's, although it's wet prairie, so it's obviously has some moisture in the ground, uh, the fact that there are no trees in these areas means there's less salamanders or less amphibians in general, including salamanders. Uh, but we also get some, uh, what you could call Western species or grassland species in this region. And that includes uh, the plains garter snake. So if you've seen a garter snake uh, in our region in Northwest Indiana, more than likely it, it was not this species. We actually have two garter snake species in our region. Uh, the plains garter snake is only found in a couple counties in Indiana and is almost entirely restricted to prairies. Uh, it, it is more common uh, further west um, and like I said before, garter snakes, not a lot of people think uh, that garter snakes, they're actually wetland species, so they like these wet prairie habitats. And another cool species that you could see in a wet prairie is the smooth green snake. And uh, you'd be pretty lucky to find a smooth green snake, uh, mostly because of how well camouflaged they are. So if you can imagine trying to find a green long uh, animal in an area that is just full of green uh, grass and vegetation, it's pretty difficult. Uh, but they're really neat snakes. Uh, they eat a lot of uh, insects and other small invertebrates, and uh, they're also endangered in the state of Indiana. Uh, a lot to do with habitat destruction because we have very uh, few prairies left in the state and really very few prairies left in the whole United States. And then uh, another grassland species you could see there, which is the northern leopard frog. Uh, these are great uh, at moving through dense vegetation, so they tend to be uh, one of the few frog species you'll find in these dense, densely vegetated wet prairies. All right, so let's head east along the lake to the high dunes section. And a lot of you are probably familiar with what this, this area looks like. If you've ever been to the Indiana Dunes National Park or the State Park, uh, it is arid, it's sandy, uh, there's almost no canopy, at least on the dunes that are facing towards the lake. Uh, wind is moving sand around constantly, so there's uh, areas where uh, the grass and other vegetation doesn't grow very well. Um, and some Shirley Hines properties that have are in the high dunes section or at least very close to it, uh, John Merle Coulter and Bayless Dune are good examples of that. And so because it's arid and sandy and there's not a lot of trees, again, we're gonna have more reptile species uh, in this region versus amphibians. But we do have some 
amphibian species that are well adapted to these types of environments. And that uh, those amphibians are toads. So toads are much more tolerant to dry habitats than their other amphibian counterparts. And we have two toad species in our region. And the one that you'll find most often in sandy areas is the Fowler's toad. Uh, Fowler's toads are more commonly found in sandy habitats than uh, the other species, which is American toads. Uh, and they actually are pretty well adapted to these dry habitats because the tadpoles of toads uh, develop very quickly. Uh, so if they breed in a wetland that will dry out in a month, that's okay for toads because their tadpoles can go from the egg to a little tiny toad very, very quickly, much more quickly than other amphibian species. Another or a different species that you'll see in the high dunes region is the hognose snake. Uh, and these can be kind of intimidating snakes if you come across one out on the preserve. Uh, because oftentimes, if you see one, they will flare out their neck like this, and they'll tilt it towards you to show you uh, just how big they are. Uh, but they are actually big babies. Uh, because if you get close and they feel even more threatened after they do this, they tend to uh, turn upside down and writhe around in a circle and play dead. They're kind of the prima donnas of uh, the herp world. Um, they're pretty funny. Uh, they seem to have kind of a personality to them. I don't know if it's the whole playing dead, dead thing, but uh, very cool snakes, uh, very often seen, again, in our sandy habitat areas. And they have, they're called the hognose snakes because the their nose scale or the rostral scale is turned up, uh, kind of like a pig's nose. Hey, Brock. Um, yeah. Somebody had asked in the chat, it, uh, is the hognose snake a Western species? Like where else would you see them in the country? They seem like such an unusual type of snake for us here. Yeah, um, they're kind of, they're a little interesting. They are more of a Southern species than they are East or West. Uh, so there's, as, there's actually a Western hognose species that's found like on the Western side of Iowa. Uh, but the Eastern hognose that we have here goes all the way to the Eastern side of Iowa and like all the way down into the Southeastern United States. So definitely more of a Southern species that uh, likes our dry, hot, sandy areas uh, rather than an east versus west thing. Cool, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And speaking on that as well, another uh, southern species that, that we have uh, that's found more commonly further south is the six-line race runner. And you've, if you've been hiking on a trail in the dunes, I am almost certain you've seen one of these little guys sprint past you or right in front of you into the brush or something like that. Uh, they got the name Race Runner for a good reason because they are very, very fast. Uh, and I, I seem to only see them when it's really hot out, like 80 degrees or above is when you'll see them. And the hotter it is, the faster they run. So <laughs> if you see them on a really hot day, you probably may not even see them. Uh, if it's cold out, that's pretty much your only chance of getting one to stop and have a good look at them. But a really cool species. And like I said, um, found further south, not really found in many of our other habitats other than the high dunes habitats here. All right, so behind those high dunes, uh, in most places we have these large wetland areas behind them uh, where water is sitting between uh, behind the high dune and the next dune behind it. 
And these are really interesting areas because uh, behind the high dunes, uh, because it doesn't get a lot of sun because it's protected from the dune, tends to be an area where there's actually more moisture and allows for amphibians to occur in this area. And then the amphibians, of course, like the wetland areas because it's a nice place to uh, breed and develop as uh, a tadpole or a larval salamander. And the great marsh uh, that Shirley Hines owns is a, a good example of that. And some cool amphibians that you can find in these habitats. Uh, one of my favorite, if not my absolute favorite, Salamander species is the four-toed salamander. Uh, this is our smallest salamander species that we have. And this species is really unique because the females will actually build a nest in moss that is next to the wetland. And so she'll build a nest and she'll have her eggs there in the nests inside the moss. And the female will stick around and guard the eggs until the eggs hatch out and the eggs will just fall into the wetland where their larval stage will then uh, grow and then develop into adults later. So really interesting, very protective uh, mothers in this uh, four-toed salamander species. Another pretty common species that you can see in interdunal wetland habitats is the brown snake. Uh, these are small snakes that get to about a foot long. Uh, they're brown as their name suggests. Uh, herpetologists aren't very creative when they come up with names. So you'll hear a lot of brown snake or uh, like this guy, it's a blue spotted salamander, they're very descriptive. So. <laughs> um, so the brown snake has like a light tan uh, stripe on its back, uh, just a brown body. Uh, easy to remember, brown snake. And then blue spotted salamanders are uh, fairly common in our region, uh, not as common further south in Indiana, as I showed in that range map earlier, uh, but they like these interdunal habitats uh, because they have good uh, spots for breeding. All right, moving even further east into the Benton Harbor Lake Plain. Now this, this area is pretty cool uh, because it has a really unique uh, habitat type called boreal flatwoods, or uh, you'll hear a lot of people just say flatwoods. Uh, and flatwoods is a unique habitat that has this kind of undulating topography to it. Uh, which basically means it's got these low areas in here that hold water, uh, mostly in the spring, and they tend to dry out later in the year. And then these small little mounds that usually have trees on them uh, in between the areas that hold water. And uh, like I mentioned in the broader trends in our region, this area is uh, well forested because it's located here on the eastern or southeastern side of Lake Michigan. So it gets more moisture uh, in general. And Ambler Flatwoods is an excellent uh, example of flatwoods habitat uh, in our region. So because it has so much wetland and it's really well forested, this is where we get more amphibian species. Uh, but we do have a snake species that uh, inhabits these areas, uh, a ribbon snake. Uh, these look like, they look like garter snakes. They're very closely related to a garter snake, uh, but they're different in that they have a little white scale in front of their eyes. And they basically have no pattern other than these three stripes on their body, where garter snakes kind of have some checkering uh, and other patterns on them. Ribbon snakes are very plain, just the stripe. And they like these wetland habitats and will hunt for frogs uh, like wood frogs. Uh, wood frogs like very forested areas. Uh, they're one of our earliest breeding uh, frog species. You'll probably hear them calling 
if you're in the right area, if you're in a good forested area, uh, here pretty soon. And then tree frogs also like these flatwood habitats. Um, this is the gray tree frog. And we actually have two tree frog species, but they're very difficult to tell apart. So I'm just gonna lump them together for this. Uh, but they like flatwoods because they climb up into trees, uh, but they still breed in the wetlands. So uh, the flatwoods offers a nice location where the trees are very close to the wetland, if not in, in the wetland areas. So it's a nice place for them to perch and call when they're breeding. Uh, and it's really quick access to uh, where they need to breed. So tree frogs love flatwoods habitat. Okay, then moving south uh, onto our next natural division, the moraine, the Valparaiso moraine. Uh, on the moraine, especially on the eastern side, we get these really dense, mature forested areas. And in these areas, we have, not only do we have these dense mature forests, but we have a lot of uh, wetlands uh, ranging from very large wetlands that hold water all year long to small wetlands that hold water in the spring and then dry out later, also known as ephemeral wetlands. And there is a lot of moisture in these uh, rich woods, as they're called, or rich music woods, as they're called, uh, habitats. And some Shirley Hines preserves that are located in this section are like Meadowbrook and Hildebrand Lake. And so because there is so much moisture retention in these dense, mature forests, we see a lot of amphibians. And one species you'll find almost exclusively in dense, mature forested areas is the spotted salamander. And these are really cool looking salamanders. They're black with these yellow spots. Um, but they, they look really similar to tiger salamanders. A lot of people get them confused. But spotted salamanders only have spots on their back, where tiger salamanders have spots. Uh, yellow spots all around uh, on the side and underneath on their bodies. And then another species of salamander in this habitat is uh, the redback salamander. And like we talked about, they don't have lungs, so they really need these moist, uh, moisture rich environments uh, that these woodland areas on the Valparaiso moraine provide. And a less common species, but uh, one of the few herb or uh, reptile species that you'll see uh, in these rich woods on the moraine is uh, the red-bellied snake. It looks just like the brown snake. Uh, and again, another great example of a non-creative name for uh, this species. Uh, they have this bright red uh, belly uh, right here. And they're the same size as the brown snake, very closely related, but they're mostly a gray color. So alternatively on the moraine, not only do you have these uh, densely forested areas, um, you also get these uh, seeps and fens on the moraine. And those are fancy words that basically just mean ground groundwater fed uh, wetlands. And typically you find these seeps and fens at the base of a steep slope. And that's why you tend to find them on the Valparaiso Moraine because the moraine is basically just a really big hill. And at the base of that hill, uh, in certain areas, the groundwater will reach the surface and you'll get these open habitats uh, that are called fens. And uh, these are open and don't have a lot of trees in them, uh, mostly because that groundwater is moving, uh, moving across them. So they're not very stable, uh, not good areas where trees can root 
uh, very well. Uh, but very, very uncommon habitats. There's not a lot of fens uh, present in our region. There's definitely a handful, but not very many. And because there's so few of them, we tend to get more rare and specialized species that live it. Uh, one being our only venomous uh, snake species, the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, this species loves fens, um, is also found in other habitats, but fens is one type of habitat you can find them in. Uh, this is a very rare species and is also very difficult to find. Uh, and they are federally threatened. Uh, so they're not, their population uh, as a whole across the country is not doing great. And a big reason for that is that people are afraid of venomous snakes. So uh, they've somebody owns a property that has one, more than likely they've been killed off uh, out of fear, which is really unfortunate because Massasaugas are one of the more docile or calm snake species I have ever come across. Uh, they are pretty much just a sit there, don't move, please leave me alone type of attitude snake. So kind of unfortunate that people have felt the need to kill them, but that's kind of the reality for them. And also, interestingly enough, usually habitat for massasaugas like these fens are also full of poison sumac. So uh, not generally areas you want to go in. Uh, if you've ever had poison ivy, you definitely don't want poison sumac. Uh, it's terrible. <laughs> Uh, another species that you can find in these fens or groundwater fed wetlands is the pickerel frog. Uh, at first glance, this may have looked like a leopard frog species, uh, and they're cl it's closely related, uh, but pickerel frogs are a little different uh, because their spots are actually paired on their backs. So uh, like a northern leopard frog, the spots will be kind of random. For pickerel frogs that are in pairs and they're also said that the spots are more square where like a northern leopard frog they'd be round or rounded and they also have this yellow color in their armpits too that also gives them away and they're mostly found in the eastern part of our region and another rare species that's found in uh, fens and Seeps is the Kirtland snake, very, very uncommon in our region, in our area, maybe even more uncommon than Massasaugas, or at least very less seen in our region than Massasaugas. Uh, but they're really neat looking snake, snake species. They have these bright red bellies and these pairs of black spots that run lengthwise down their bodies, on their bellies and kind of this reddish brown tinge uh, on their backs. And they live pretty much exclusively in wetland habitats. All right, so now moving further east again in some for forested sections is the Northern Lakes Natural Division where we have uh, kettle lakes and bogs and then the associated uh, forests around them. Um, and this has kind of an interesting area within this region. It's called the Kettle Lakes Corridor, the South Bend Kettle Lakes Corridor. Uh, it's this chain of kettle lakes or uh, shrubby wetlands and bog areas that extends north to south, uh, just west of South Bend. And Shirley Hines has a uh, nature preserve in that chain called Lytic Bog Nature Preserve uh, that has a series of wetlands and, of course, a bog. So it's a really cool preserve um, with a lot of wetland habitat there. And some herbs you can find that are associated with kettle lakes and bogs. Uh, 
is our cricket frog. The cricket frog uh, likes lake habitats. Uh, the most, they're kind of different than other uh, small frog species because they like lakes rather than areas that have better, uh, more dense vegetation. Uh, but they're very small and their call kind of sounds like two marbles uh, getting knocked together. Uh, but unfortunately, this species is not doing well either. Uh, and herpetologists are not entirely sure why. There's a lot of theories floating out why their numbers have been declining. Um, but for some reason, cricket frogs are not doing very well, which is unfortunate. Cool little frogs. Uh, another interesting species you can find in kettle lakes and bogs is the Blandings turtle. These are really neat uh, turtles. Uh, they're our happiest turtle species, I like to say, because it always looks like they are smiling. Um, they always have a happy face on, which is nice. Um, they also have a very distinctive uh, bright yellow neck or throat. Uh, so underneath uh, their head, the bottom side of their head, on the bottom side of their neck is this bright yellow, which is really easy to tell them apart from other species if you get close enough. Uh, and also from afar, you can tell them apart because they have a very domed shell. So like painted turtles, their shells are kind of flat on top. Uh, Blanding's turtles are very domed. And then Another species you can find in kettle lakes uh, is the eastern newt. And eastern newts are very unique amphibians because, as we mentioned before, most amphibians have two life stages. Well, eastern newts didn't think that was good enough, so they have three life stages. Uh, they have a aquatic larval stage, just like most amphibians. They have a terrestrial, uh, what is called an EFT stage, that's spelled E-F-T, uh, which is basically, basically once they metamorphose from their larval stage, they're kind of a smaller version of the adults, and they go on to land and they travel across land into these new wetlands. And once they find a new wetland to go into, they will then uh, actually develop like this paddle tail and they'll become fully aquatic again as a fully grown adult. So it's really kind of an interesting life cycle that they have that's unique to most amphibians. So they like these kettle lake areas because they have two life stages that uh, where they are fully aquatic. So they need some good aquatic habitat. All right, our last one is uh, the Kinkakee Marsh section with the sandy uplands and the what used to be the Kinkakee Marsh, but is now res uh, reserved to just some drainage areas and ditches. So there's a lot of agriculture in this area, a lot of ditches, as I mentioned, some small pockets of intact habitat. Uh, but for the most part, the herps that are here have somehow persisted in the very altered habitat that we have. And one of those species is the five-lined skink. Uh, that is a southern, uh, another southern species. And for some reason, the five-lined skink seems to be oddly associated with the edges of the old Kankakee Marsh in very sandy areas. Uh, and even in areas that aren't really that high of quality. Uh, I found one last year or a couple last year next to an area that was severely ditched about five feet from a very busy highway underneath an old sign. So uh, kind of an interesting species are not very common uh, up in our region, but they're much more common further south. So cool, uh, that's our third lizard species that we've talked about today. Uh, in the ditches and what would have been in areas that were the Kankakee Marsh where these 
Uh, this is a lesser siren. And the old Kinky Key Mars, I have no doubt the lesser sirens were very common in that area because it is exactly the habitats they like. They like these big wetland areas that are kind of mucky bottoms. Um, and the lesser siren is a really unique species because they're very long, uh, they're fully aquatic. And this probably isn't a fantastic picture to show it, but they have um, external gills. So they have gills to allow them to more efficiently breathe uh, or have gas exchange underwater. And then our last species is the ornate box turtle. So we have two box turtle species in our region. The Eastern box turtle is by far the most common, uh, which you can find in a variety of habitats, but the ornate box turtle is almost exclusive to sandy prairie habitat. And this is definitely a grassland species, uh, more common further west, but still not that common uh, because a lot of their habitat has been destroyed, unfortunately but a very cool, uh, uncommon uh, box turtle species that we have in our region. Hey Brock, okay. I have a couple of yeah. questions that have popped up that I certainly can't answer. Um, okay. <laughs> I think the previous slide before this, someone asked, are these the bright colored Fs, EFTs? Yes, yeah. So, and it depends on what part of the country you're in, whether you have the bright red colored Fs, also called the red Fs. Uh, in our region, they don't get that bright red color. Uh, but if you go out further east to like Ohio is when you start getting into this subspecies that has the bright red color. And they're really, really cool. Uh, people love taking pictures of them with a bright green moss background. They really pop off of that. So. Really, really cool looking uh, red Fs. So now the next slide someone asked, is the siren a salamander? Yes, yeah. So, so yes, the, the siren is a species of salamander. Yep. And somebody popped up, what is an F? So I assume that's like <laughs> a, a yeah, common so, name or something. Yeah, the F is the second uh phase of the newt life stage so the first life stage of a newt is their larval stage the second stage is their eft stage and then the third one is uh the adult newt cool wish i had a diagram because that would probably Thank explain you. it much better but one asked is the siren related to the axol Axolotus? Axolotl. Axolotls. There you go. Um, no, actually, but I get why you're asking that because they both have external gills. That's uh, two traits that have in common, but axolotls are more closely related to like the tiger salamanders, the spotted salamanders, the blue spotted salamanders that, that we have. Uh, so the larval stages of those salamanders look just like axolotls. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Brock. Yep. I think that I think I got them all. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, now that I've rambled on about all these habitats and uh, herbs that you can go find in them, it's time to go out and uh, explore yourself. So. I think our area, as I stated before, offers this really unique opportunity to see herps from all over the country. And hopefully, uh, I hope what you take away from this, uh, when you go out to a Shirley Hines preserve or any preserve, uh, you kind of go through your mind uh, back to this presentation and think about some of the herps that you can see in for that particular habitat that you might be in. And I know that I didn't go over every herb species in our region or every habitat, 
Uh, I'm pretty sure I would have rambled on for three hours and you guys would have been bored out of your minds if I did that. Uh, so as a reference, uh, go check out the Indiana Herb Atlas, uh, which is in herbatlas.org. Uh, that has great pictures and descriptions of our herb species in the whole state uh, with range maps that show where they live and descriptions. And also this book by Sherman Minton, Amphibians and Reptiles of Indiana is another great reference. And I'll also make a plug for iNaturalist and HerpMapper uh, to use these apps while you're out and about. Uh, there's not a lot of money floating out to pay people to go look for uh, herps in general. And it's kind of our first uh, line of defense in terms of making conservation plans and uh, making important conservation decisions about these species is first thing we have to know where they are and where they're not. So uh, citizen science uh, apps like iNaturalist and HerbMapper are really important tools uh, for land managers and scientists to use as a whole. So please use those while, while you're out hiking around and if you find something. I agree. Uh, we do use those and look at those quite often to stay current. So we appreciate it when people are using iNaturalist and things like that on the um, on the preserves. So it keeps a awesome. good database for us to to reference. <laughs> yeah, you're getting See, lots you of thank yous and and um, wonderful presentation and things like that in the chat. Oh, great. Um, Thanks. Yeah. yeah Brock, if anybody's got other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I have a question. Do we have okay. seal salamanders in Indiana? Uh, no, we don't have uh, seal salamanders. Uh, seal salamanders are actually live in streams, and you really only get uh, stream dwelling salamanders uh, further south. I think probably Shades State Park is the closest area where you could find some, or at least reliably find some stream salamanders. Uh, but seal salamanders, you probably have to go even further south than that into Southern Indiana or into the Appalachians even. Cool, was there any other um herps or reptiles and amphibians and things that uh, Brock mentioned that, of course, he can't cover them all. Was there anything that people particularly had a question about or was hoping to hear about uh, that we didn't cover? And I, I will admit that I learned a few things uh, today. I, I had no idea what it <laughs> all right. was. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Well, I have a question about uh, one type of salamander and your experience with it. And that is the uh, all-female hybrid salamanders that uh, to yeah. get everybody up on. There are some of these pond breeding salamanders that are all females, and they're a hybrid of two or more other species. Mm -hmm. One up here, in, we, there's a pond that I take my class to every year, and the morphology of the salamanders looks like they belong in the Jefferson complex. They're large not checking mm -hmm. back on the background and very faint spots. Yet there's yeah. no Jefferson around here. So have you ever seen any of those Jefferson-like hybrids in your, in your field experience? And if so, where did you see them? Yeah, uh, we definitely have hybrids in our, in our region. Uh, you tend to, at least from my experience, I've seen them more in the eastern portion and in the more densely forested areas in our region, but I've definitely seen one in the dunes. Um, the problem is to correctly identify whether it's a hybrid or not, you need like a genetic test. So, and that's probably why there's not great records for, for hybrids in our region because nobody's doing any genetic studies of them uh, here. I, I was told by a more senior herpetologist that has a ton of experience in this region that if you see like a blue spotted like salamander and it's over 13 centimeters, then it's likely a hybrid. 
13 centimeters total length. Um, so <laughs> I know that's not a great answer and it, it's kind of this mystery, uh, mystery box area for herpetology in general. These unisexual salamanders are very complicated and difficult to identify, but a very interesting biology and genetic uh, things going on with them. And we're very fortunate. Indiana is going to have a new geneticist come to Marion University, I think it is, in Indianapolis, who's an expert on the hybrids. Oh, he really? Hasn't, okay. He hasn't started yet. I think he comes in the fall. I heard that. So oh, we're awesome. all of a sudden going to go from the black hole to the all-star. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I'd love to know more about, I, I admittedly know not enough about the genetics and you know, some of the ecology about that whole uh, unisexual group, but very interesting nonetheless. I'm uh, seeing some other questions in the chat. Um, I can read them out loud so everyone can uh, catch what we're talking about, but someone asked how far north in Indiana uh, can you find the hellbenders? They know that oh, they're in uh, Bloomington. Yeah, not not very far. Definitely not north of Indianapolis. Uh, they need very cold, fast flowing streams, uh, which obviously here in northern Indiana, especially, we don't have a lot of fast flowing, uh, silt free, cold streams. Um, I I wouldn't be able to give you like a specific town that you can't find them north of, but southern Indiana is basically where they're restricted to. We won't find them in the dunes. No. I'll, I'll, I'll no. talk a little bit on that because uh, we have an expert on the hellbender at Purdue University, Rod Williams, and, and they're mm -hmm. not actually found in Bloomington. They're only found in the Blue River, barely into Indiana from the Ohio River. They're almost extinct from Indiana, yeah. but they're yeah. only in mm -hmm. the Blue River. Um, yep. Somebody asked, they said, I saw a huge turtle in the Great Marsh. What is common there? So I assume that it's, if it's a huge turtle, it's a snapper. And so somebody yeah. else, follow up question, said snapping turtle distribution in Northwest Indiana? Question mark. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Pointing out where they, they've seen them. So, um, okay. Yeah. Generally, if it's a huge turtle, I'm with you, Eric. It's more than likely a, a snapping turtle. <laughs> Because they get massive and they are one of our more common turtle species. They're found in almost any, uh, any habitat, any aquatic habitat, you can find uh, snapping turtles. They'll even be really like. Have, there wouldn't be anything else that would even get near that big, right? Like I've never no. seen, I can't think of another species that we would see. No. Yeah. I mean, if it's, if it looks like it's too heavy to pick up, it's a snapping turtle. <laughs> and maybe you don't want to pick it up at either <laughs> yeah probably not yeah they, they get a little feisty somebody asked up the line uh do sirens have the chance of metamorphosizing like an axolotl uh they do not so sirens will stay in that fully aquatic stage uh for their entire life they don't have like a terrestrial adult stage uh, that other salamanders have. Cool. Well, I, I think that I got all the questions, but people, you can feel free to unmute or pop in uh, with any questions. I have to say like, I, I did learn things and um, thank you. I, I wouldn't, these are questions I couldn't answer. So it's great to have herpetologists that work with us and partner with us and we appreciate. And I assume the other person that uh, was giving us factual information is uh, Dr. Court Wright. Is that who um, was popping in? So thank you to our friends that can help us do these kinds of presentations. We're so very grateful for that. Yeah, absolutely. Always a joy. Someone asked if there's soft shell turtles in Indiana. Yes. Yeah, we have uh, spiny soft shells uh, here in our region. Uh, they like rivers and lakes, sandy areas of rivers and lakes. 
kind yeah, of they're... rare anymore. I mean, I remember seeing them a lot when I was a kid, but um, yeah. yeah, it's a rare thing to see. Yeah, I, I don't see them nearly as much as I did in, like I grew up in Iowa. I used to see them in Iowa all the time. Uh, don't see them nearly as frequently here for whatever reason. Well, a good a good time to find them is a warm, sunny day in April along the Kankakee River. If you can drive along a oh. levee, they don't they don't jump into the water if you're driving, and you can see oh. dozens <laughs> of them. You, you could yeah. see dozens of them along there. Yeah, lots of good sandy sandy shorelines there for sure. So they probably like that we a lot. We were at the Great Marsh today, and we heard several frogs could you tell us what we probably heard yeah you're de you're definitely hearing chorus frogs uh right now and uh spring peepers as well uh chorus frogs love they're they're very early uh breeding frog species they're both of those are very small uh frogs but yeah spring i've heard spring peepers and chorus frogs so far this year Wood frogs won't be too far behind. Thank you. Somebody had mentioned they heard wood frogs uh, near their house in the chat. Oh, room. really? Okay. Um, and maybe do you start hearing uh, the toads as well? The toads kind of spilling at this time? Uh, they'll be a little later, but yeah, not not too far behind uh, some of those, those first three uh, species that get going. Someone said, what are the chances of finding a blue bullfrog? Is that a thing? That oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is actually a thing. Uh, I have no idea. I've never seen one. Um, I don't know. They're, they're kind of weird. Yeah, you only see them once in a blue moon. Oh, um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, could you tell us why the ambler is called is part of Benton uh, Harbor. What, what was yeah, it? So, yeah, so it's called Benton Benton Harbor Lake Plain because that general region extends all the way up to Benton Harbor, oh. uh, and it's it's kind of similar to that whole Michigan portion of that lake of Lake Plain. Does it start in Benton Harbor? Uh. I'm not sure exactly where it goes up in that uh, up in Berrien County, uh, but I know it it doesn't extend all the way in Indiana. So, uh, an Ambler, how how close is Ambler to the state line? It's not that far away. Oh yeah, real really close. Yeah, it's really close. So, yeah, and I, I would say I mean those are just somebody's naming conventions right i mean yeah they're, they're calling it something at, and associating it to either a landform or a county area or, or or some landmark with that how often does a snake shed oh our question. um it depends um <laughs> Uh, snakes shed their skin, uh, you know, as they're growing. Um, yeah, I don't even have a great estimate. Someone who owns snakes would probably have a better answer for that than I do. I'm not sure how, how frequently. I know it depends on, you know, how old they are, how Maybe much how they're much growing, they eat and how much like they that, eat, yeah. yeah. Somebody, uh, so this is a great kind of takeaway kind of thing. Um, what would you like to see to help conserve herbs? What can the public do to help? Um, I think a, a big thing uh, people can do that, it, uh, one is the citizen science portion. Recording things that you see is, is a big thing uh, because like I said, there's not, it's kind of amazing how little information and a lack of current surveys we have for a lot of areas in Indiana. And it's, you know, it, it's not something that necessarily gets a lot of money thrown at it, um, which is understandable, but uh, 
you know, you can go out and uh, there's also a frog monitoring program that is also helpful for recording uh, where species are located and is kind of a, a more formalized survey method. Uh, I might say also, that I noticed uh, a lot of people on here said they love snakes. And I often notice yeah. that many, many people are afraid of snakes. So um, getting your friends or your kids and teaching them at an early age that those things aren't scary and they're good and they're okay. Um, they're not just creepy, slimy things, but we care about them and they're part of the ecosystem. Yeah, one thing, that's one thing we can excellent. Do one thing we can do to help is contact our state senators and our state representatives because the Indiana State Senate passed a bill taking away protections for many wetlands in Indiana, which means that people could drain wetlands at will. And so we should talk to our representatives and Senate and say, no, that's not a good idea. Yeah, and I thought of that when you were talking about the Massasagas and that, you know, that that is certainly true that people kill them because they're, uh, a poisonous snake that they're afraid of. But uh, I would say another reason is just loss of habitat, right? That they, they need such unique habitat requirements and they're very habitat dependent. And when you lose those fens and wetlands, they don't have enough space to maintain those populations. So mm -hmm. maybe especially get hit hard from that kind of a thing. Yeah, the habitat destruction is one of the primary uh, reasons why many herb species and many other species for that matter are uh, declining. So protections for those are very important. Um, do you mind keep going with questions? Is that okay? I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get a roll of them here. <laughs> it's uh, fine with me. Um, are any herb species considered migratory? Do they, you know, do they leave for the season or anything like that? What do they do in winter? Uh, yes, yeah, so they're definitely considered migratory, but maybe not in the sense that you would think of like birds being migratory. So in the spring, uh, migrations of uh, amphibians going from their terrestrial habitat to the wetlands for breeding is considered a, a migration event. Uh, it's a much smaller scale than like uh, what birds do, of course, uh, but it's this mass movement of animals from one habitat or one area to another. So that's considered a migration. And that's maybe when you see them like crossing the roads and things like that. When yeah. Like that. Yeah, definitely. I, someone had seen said earlier, uh, I kind of lost it now, but that they were a beekeeper. Are there reptiles and snakes that eat bees like are going to get in their beehive and such? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I've never heard of that uh, being the case anyways. I would think something that would be more likely to do that would be a lizard species, but I'm pretty sure uh, the lizard species that we have, or, and most lizards, wouldn't bother going after bees. It would be too much of a, a risk. They would pick up something much easier. Birds do though, right? I, I know there's certain yeah. birds that eat bees. Yeah. Um, somebody had asked and uh what is your favorite snake lizards or snakes and i know that you had uh pointed out the four-toed salamander so is there yeah. a, a snake or lizard that's that's kind of the top of your list uh i think smooth green snake is one of my favorites uh i love prairies in general so uh, a cool snake that's it's also very challenging to find, which excites me a little bit. Uh, so I love green snakes. Yeah, they're very um, amazing. They look like they don't belong here. You, when you yeah, see right. them, they look like, I'm like, they, this escaped from a cut store or something. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, this must be a tropical species. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Uh, lizards, uh, glass lizards, just because they're really unique and they don't have limbs. What is the glass lizard's like uh, most recent ancestor, or, like common ancestor? Oh boy, is this a trick question? Like you know, the answer that was like, I don't yeah, yeah. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me whatever you want. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. 
Um, the crocodile. I'm going to say crocodile. Spencer, do you know? Do they have any? Do they, you think? Do they have living relatives in the United States? The glass lizard. Yeah. Uh, ah, I think that's a good question. I think they're kind of in their own little evolutionary line. Yeah, like there's nothing else like them, really. I, I know that they still have like a uh, pelvic, like pelvic girdles or like a structure inside their body where limbs would be attached to, uh, but obviously they don't have any limbs. Um, that doesn't really answer your question, but <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Not knowing is a good answer too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, um, it seems like you got lots of thanks and praises and amazing presentation. Um, we're coming up on 728. So uh, leave a little room for any final additional questions or any final words you want to give to people about snakes and herbs before we go. Uh, I just want to reiterate what Eric said that uh, teaching your friends and family to uh, appreciate herbs and especially snakes is really important. So thanks for bringing that up here. I like that, that point you made. So, you know, I uh, was at, uh, I was walking the dunes this last weekend with my little, uh, my great nephews who are younger and one of them was coming around a tree and, you know, I had to say stop because he was about to step on a, a blue racer and, oh. uh, it was amazing. They were just amazed by it. Right. But I had to like, <laughs> at the same time, be like, don't approach it, like leave him alone. And he's stressed and he's cold. And um, yeah, you just know that with kids like that, that sticks with them. Right. They'll remember that forever. And that's, really yeah. Cool. And for the most part, kids are like fascinated by it. They love snakes. And it, it's kind of amazing to see kids that are fascinated and love them. And somehow that turns into not liking them sometimes. So definitely an important, important thing to do. Yeah, thank you. Um, anything final you uh, want to say, Sarah? Am I, am I preemptively wrapping this up or anything? I, uh, a no, lot I of things that we get into that. chats now is kind, of, is kind of thank yous and thank you so much. Uh, so thank you, Brock, and thank you everybody for yep. joining us. And thanks for this crowd and these amazing questions that kept the conversation going. That's very much appreciated. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. We'll see you guys at the next event. Sarah, is, the, is there a, a Our next, next event? talk is April 20th. Um, Kim N with the Dean's Climate Audubon will be talking to us about how we can contribute to community science with the Climate Watch and help the birds in the backyards and all across the region. Yeah, so join us next time, folks. And um, thank you again to Brock Stricker. Round of uh, little clappy hands on the Zoom. Um, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bye, everyone. Thank you. We still live on Facebook. I wish there was a way to like select the people I want to move to the waiting room. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah Frost. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much, Brock.